Our guest today, Lee, has got a career that to be envied. I mean, you talk about somebody that's, you know, walking, living history, particularly in the tech world. I'm very much looking forward to talking to him and about his take on big business, little business, and one of the number one mistakes he says all managers seem to make. Well, that's for sure. And, you know, we've got, we've got a lot of questions, so I say we just jump right into it. Okay, welcome to Manage Smarter, everyone. My name is Audrey Strong. I'm the Vice President of Communications here at SalesFuel. I'm Celie Smith. I am the CEO and founder of SalesFuel. That's right. And in the cutthroat world of tech, Neil Day, he is a battle-tested veteran with 40 years of experience in the industry. He's led tech teams at Walmart.com, Shutterfly, Blue Bottle Coffee, and more. Also worked at Apple. Now he's fighting a new battle as the CTO of R0, the first company built from the ground up to tackle the transmission of pathogens in the COVID-19 era, and as we move into the endemic as well. And so uh, welcome, Neil. I know, Lee, you wanted to ask him with sort of a peer-to-peer C-suite, 2,000 <laughs> foot type of question. We talked about this in advance, so have at it. Well, so, I mean, you know, you, you manage tech teams that, you know, Apple computers, walmart.com. And then you go and you launch a, a, a coffee tech startup in 2015. Yes. So I would be curious as I compare and contrast with the difference between managing a large tech team to managing at a startup. What's that? What's the difference between the two? Yeah, it's a great question. And thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and uh, delighted to have the chance to talk to you. So, um, so I think the big difference between large companies and, and startups is kind of how you have to calibrate your thinking about the goals that you're accomplishing. So, you know, usually at larger companies, uh, there's sort of a clearer playbook. Um, you've gotten uh, a sense of what your market looks like and what you need to do to service that market. Um, and at startups, uh, there are just so many open questions um, that it can be very difficult to plan. And so when I think about managing teams at small companies, uh, there are a couple of things that that become really important. One is making sure that everybody has context on the problems that you're trying to solve. And this is important at big companies too, but particularly when there are lots of open questions, the more um, that your team understands what you're trying to accomplish and why the more effectively they can contribute so so context and even more transparency becomes really important at small companies um the other big difference is usually your job at a startup is removing unknowns as quickly as you can and so um you tend to focus on um figuring out how to run experiments that are going to give you more information that help you understand the path forward. Um, and so there's a premium on doing more experiments faster and getting meaningful results quicker. Um, and that, that really impacts how you think about development and particularly uh, how you think about managing the team on a day-to-day -day basis. So is that the experiments that you speak about? Does that relate to what you say when you say the number one mistake that a lot of managers make is flying too close to the sun? But isn't that what startups are about, pushing the boundaries and going for the, you know, the, the new? Yeah, it, uh, it is. Um, and it's a balance between um, you know, learning quickly and getting into market um, and getting the right data and over-investing. So, you know, one of the mistakes that I think a lot of startups make is um, sort of uh, overthinking and overinvesting in platform too early, um, because in a lot of cases, you just don't know what your final product is going to look like. And, um, you know, the amount of thought and work that goes into building all of the infrastructure um, and uh creating all of the components of a platform is considerable. And it, it may not help you get to where you need to be um, in those early phases. So uh, usually you want to balance sort of that experimental approach and learning about your customer and your product with making long-term investments um, that are going to help you in the next phase of your company. And, you know, so an example of that at R0 was um, 
when we were thinking about our first product, uh, we were thinking really hard about time to market and how we could um, basically use rapid prototyping and rapid manufacturing techniques to, to get to market faster and not worrying so much about um, the, the bill of materials cost and the construction cost of the first hundred devices we made. So we made a lot of um, decisions that would be ridiculous if you were building, you know, 5,000 or 10,000 devices. Um, but we knew we needed to get the real finished product into customers' hands as quickly as possible. So, you know, we paid $500 a leg wow. for a CNC <laughs> um, aluminum legs on our, on our device, knowing that we'd be able to replace that with you know, a die cast part that was um, under fifty dollars um, in the in the final product. So, so that's an example of you know optimizing for speed, um, and that allowed us to get the product into customers' hands, get really valuable feedback, um, make some adjustments before we invested in tooling, um, and um, and and basically learn a lot. And we've done that with all of our products. We've we've done a, a let's call it a uh, a saleable prototype um, uh, that was um, that was uh, expensive to build, you know, still had reasonable economics and we'd done the analysis so we knew we could make them cost effectively. Um, but uh, for us, it was important to get those first 100 or 200 out to customers that were fully functional, for fully certifiable, you know, they did everything the final product um, would do, but uh, we just decided to turn the cost knob um, way up to get that done fast. And then, but we knew we could produce um, uh, economically viable ones um, pretty quickly there. I've, I've got a couple of follow-up questions. It's like, sure. one is on this topic, then I want to circle back to Audrey's question. But uh, on on this is like you know, it sounds like you're kind of talking a little bit about the concept of the minimum viable product, yes. And and that's not a, a concept that everybody is familiar with, even though it's kind of old hat to people like like you. And we can explain that a little bit then for for our, for our audience. Yeah, absolutely. So the the idea of a minimum viable product is you really want to strip whatever you're making down to its core essence. Um, so. Uh, you won't worry about um, features that only 50% um, of your um, audience are likely to use, um, or uh, you know, you might restrict the uh, the scope of the product to only do two things instead of the five things you know it can do eventually. You want to, you really want to boil it down to the kind of the pure expression of whatever it is you're you're building um and you know when you're doing development a lot of times you you kind of have this process where you're expanding on the idea and you know sort of exploring all of the possibilities and all of the uh potential and that's important as you're kind of developing the concept but then there's this really important phase where you go through and you defer all of the stuff that not 100% of your customers are going to need and use all the time. And, and, and that allows you to hopefully create a smaller, um, easier to implement thing that you can get to market a lot faster and, and start that learning process against because it really is all about learning. It's what your customers care about. It's what makes the product great. Um, and, and getting that, that essence right sets you up for um, success down the line, basically. Um, so back to Audrey's question, it, it was about, you know, the number one mistake that leaders and managers make. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was an Icarus reference, which I always yes. love. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm thinking about your time at Apple and you left before Steve Jobs came, came to Apple, right? Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of CEOs that were kind of like the spokespeople for the company, you know, and, and Steve Jobs, certainly one of them, Elon Musk, some, you know, there's plenty of them um, that, that are out there. Mm -hmm. What are the warning signs, though, when the, the CEO or the leader, you know, becomes a cult of personality and becomes bigger than the product itself and need, maybe needs to step back because there, there's so much ego and hubris that that could lead to the downfall? Yeah, well, 
That's interesting. I, I think that's kind of a whole problem unto itself. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, when, when management teams start to uh, kind of believe their own mythology, you, you get into a whole bunch of problems. Um, um, you know, Apple at the time that I was there, you know, they'd already established a very solid place in the market. The Macintosh was a great product. I, I would say it was adrift um, while I was there because they were trying to be too many things to too many different constituencies. And, you know, what Jobs did when he came back was really refocus the company on kind of its kind of its core mission. So, so I would say, you know, the thing Jobs should and has gotten a lot of credit for was really bringing Apple back to its roots and and to kind of its core focus. Where I think, um, you know, Scully and the the management team that was in place in the non Jobs years, uh, you know, were were trying to do too much and and trying to, you know, appeal to too many disparate audiences and. And I'd say that's actually a big problem for startups is, you know, the allure of big ideas is that they're applicable to lots of different um, uh, potential uses and customers. And, and it's, it, it's often a pitfall that people will try to attack too much of that um, at, at an early phase of the company and not get really good at one or two critical things. So you know, I, I guess I'm across the board a big fan of the whole minimum viable product concept um, mm -hmm. as it relates to both product development and focus for companies. Um, you know, this has been said a ton, but, you know, the most important part of strategy is the things that you're not going to do um, and, you know, really keeping uh, your focus on on the stuff that's going to make an, uh, a measurable difference for you. Um, and so I think the you know, to kind of relate it back to the to the start of the question, you know, when you have management teams that become more focused on on kind of the position of the company or, you know, even the, you know, the mystique of the founder, you you tend to drift away from um, that core minimum viable product that uh, that oh. I think is what you need to really make progress early on. So focus ends up being a huge thing. So r0.com is your website. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other, I have to ask this because it was on the wonderful packet that your team sent us. <clears throat> the other end of that spectrum of what we just talked about was a topic that you call when to be a technology tortoise. Yeah. Well, here you are, Mr. <laughs> tech, the walking embodiment of tech history. We're so lucky to have you. And yet there are times you're saying not to embrace it so much. What the heck are you talking about? He's I talking about know. social media, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I probably have the smallest social media footprint of any of Oh your my guests. God, that's so <laughs> ironic. Okay. Yeah, I just, I, um, there are lots of reasons for that, but I've just, uh, it, it's just not something I spend a lot of time on. Um, okay. But um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, for me, the interesting challenge is, you know, once you understand your your problem, um, you know, whether it's a product or, you know, how you go to market, how do you apply just enough technology to get you where you need to be without over investing? Um, okay. Um, you know, the, the thing is, everything you develop has consequences, um, you know, Every line of code you write um, needs to be maintained and and you know go through quality assurance. And so, um, you know, the less you have, the the easier your problem is in some sense. Um, and this is something we talk a lot about uh, um, on our engineering, uh, especially in the um, electrical engineering part. Like, you know, some minor changes that seem innocuous can have huge software consequences and you know, a part of my job is making sure we understand the whole picture effectively um, so that, uh, you know, we're, we're not adding complexity in that we're going to regret later on. So, mm -hmm. so being very lean in how we use technology um, is, is very important because it actually makes us more nimble down the line. 
Um, so just enough technology um, is important. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of the Goldilocks problem, right? Um, you know, uh, too much and you have consequences and too little and you have other consequences. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a big part of where, you know, experience and, and judgment plays into this. It's, you know, how do you, how do you match kind of the tools to the problem in a lot of ways. Then you get sort of like the other thing that's going on, which is this shiny new toy thing. And if you yes. get enamored with that, then then I wonder it's like if that kind of leads to you using new technology as a you know as a solution in, in search of a product. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting balance. Um, you know, new technologies can be phenomenal. Um, you know, we're all beneficiaries of Moore's law and just the escalating amount of uh, compute and memory and network that we have every day. And, you know, it just makes it, it makes things possible that, that you just couldn't do previously. And so, you know, you definitely want to embrace um, improvements in, in technology because they give you capabilities. There is a dark side, though, which is everything new is typically unproven right out of the gate. And so, you know, you, you have to think carefully about how much the benefit is actually going to cost you in terms of learning curve. You know, in a lot of cases, um, you know, with new hardware and new software, you're actively debugging stuff. Um, we have had an interesting experience with a new component that, um, you know, has turned out to be great for us, but it was really painful bringing it up initially. We spent months kind of getting our head around this new thing. It allowed us to do something that wasn't possible previously, but um, it definitely had a cost associated with it. Um, and making sure that that shiny new technology that you're selecting is actually the right solution for the right. problem that you're trying to solve as opposed to just using it because it's new and everyone's got going gee whiz and everyone's impressed that you're adopting it exactly yeah it's it's what is the what's the benefit and what do you have to do to actually um recognize that benefit is is important and so we we carefully evaluate new stuff to you know, understand what risks are and, and, you know, sometimes you just have to go with it and, and manage through it as best you can. But, but there are definitely times where, um, you know, we've just said, Hey, we're not going to do that because um, it's opening up Pandora's box and, and we just don't want to go there. There is an interesting um, effect too, that's more related to team building and, and management. Okay, um, great. In, in some cases, adopting a new technology can be a huge um, benefit to prospective employees. So um, at a number of companies, we've made uh, technology stack decisions specifically because that's where all the good engineers wanted to be. Um, so um, at homewarehouse.com um, back in the late 90s, uh, we decided to go 100% Java when that was uh, a, a pretty edgy uh, choice for, um, for website development. And it was because, you know, a lot of the really good engineers at that point were excited to build, you know, scalable production software in Java where, you know, PHP or even C++ would have been a, a more standard choice at the time. Back then people were using Flash. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> that was horrible. That it was, was horrible. yes. I'm, I'm glad those days are over. Um, but, but you know, we we intentionally decided to do that because it made recruiting a lot easier, and and people were oh. fired up to figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's happened a number of times. Um, Interesting. Well, we got about a minute left, Neil. What uh, rzero.com is the company. What else do you are, are you working on, or do you want to share with our audience? Um. Well, That's the main one, right? Yeah, I mean, what's what's the next chapter, you know, for for R zero? Oh like, yeah. So you, you, you've you've you're, you've addressed the pandemic. Then, then with the solution, are you looking at other uh, uses or applications Absolutely. of that technology? Are you looking at doing something new? Yeah. Um, well, so about two months into R zero, um, mm -hmm. all of us stepped back and went, "Holy smokes!" we would have started this company even without the pandemic because there's so much opportunity uh -huh. here. Um, so, you know, we've really been focused on disinfection and making public spaces safe. Um, 
uh, for people to return to. But uh, you know, we really view our longer term objective as making healthier, safer places for for people. So, you know, we're starting to look very carefully at uh, kind of the whole healthy buildings movement and um, how how we start to correct some of the um, side effects of um, the green building and energy efficiency that's been um, so uh, important over the last decade. You know, um, uh, commercial spaces have thought a lot about uh, being greener and being more energy efficient, but that's had some other consequences. Um, you know, uh, modern buildings are basically uh, very much airtight. And so indoor air quality starts to become a big issue. Um, and uh, we think there's some really interesting opportunities around that that are uh, natural complements to what we do in disinfection. So um, just thinking about how we make workplaces uh, healthier, um, more livable for people and, and uh, creating a, kind of a better work environment is uh, some of the uh, some of the next stuff that we're, we're really starting to dig in on now. It's fascinating. Good luck with all that, Neil. And uh, what, what an interesting career you've had and what an in interesting person you are. And I'm sure our audience got some good lessons today. So we appreciate it. Thank you. It's been wonderful to speak with you guys.